Hi, guys. How are you? All right. So by a quick show of hands, because you guys have listened to a lot of VC talk today, right? How many people in the room are either have taken angel investing so far? Okay. How many people have taken venture? Less. How many people plan to raise venture capital within the next 12 to 18 months? All right, cool. Okay, so let's go with this. So I will tell you that every VC, one of the most critical points that they're going to want to know is the why. So why are you raising money? And by that, I don't, don't tell them that you're raising money to grow because they'll kind of show you the door. Um, and as a buddy of mine once said, as he was trying to raise, if they're not telling you yes, they're telling you no, right? That doesn't mean that it's no forever, as you've all talked about earlier, but it means it's no for now. So when I say don't just tell them to grow, be very specific in what you're raising the money for, right? I'm going to make these three critical hires over the next 12 months. This is what those three critical hires are going to do to grow the company. I'm going to spend X amount on marketing in this space. This is the expected return because they're going to hold you to those metrics as you go forward. So the basics of raising venture capital, right? I won't go through all of this, but there's a couple of pieces that are pretty important. You have to be a C-Corp, right? Ideally in Delaware, um, if you're in the U.S., um, because otherwise they're going to kind of change the rules on you. The other thing is securing your IP. And by securing your IP, like some things can be patented, I understand in today's world, not all software can be patented, and that's okay. Actually, one of my companies um, that we sold to Akamai, um, no patents, but we created a really interesting trade secret policy that allowed us to protect our IP, our IP. And at the time that we were negotiating with them, it actually made a, you know, five-digit million dollar difference in the value of the company. So that's a lot of money when you start dividing it up amongst co-founders. Um, we talked a little bit about big markets, those kind of things. I think you guys can grab that. When I say cleaning up messes, there's a couple of kind of messes that you want to clean up. So the cap table needs to be clean, kind of like a couple of the speakers earlier today have talked about. They don't want 50 people in the cap table, right? It doesn't look very good. So if you're structuring deals early on and you end up taking money from several people, like in the angel pool, do your best to put the term sheet in your favor for that, where you can either, it's convertible debt, so you can buy them out at that point so the VCs can say goodbye to them. That's one great way to do it. Um, or figure out some sort of consolidated structure, because if the cap table gets really ugly, or you give up 40% of your company up front, you're now you're not investable, right? So the team. So when we talk about team, right, it depends on the stage of the company, but the team is always, always, always important. So if you are a first-time founder, how many first-time founders? Okay, so if you're Mark Schuster, it's really cool, right, because then people just give you money because that's your name. Um, and if you are second or third-time founders, then it's very easy to raise money. But the first time around, you're not a proven entity. So they don't really know what to expect from you. So they're kind of going with gut feel. Angels are definitely going with gut feel, but VCs, it's still kind of like, okay, let me validate. So if you can get people to vouch for you, that's awesome. Prove your track record when you're going in to meet with them. Say, like, here's some things I've done. When you're presenting to a VC, explain what you've done in the past, even if in the past wasn't in a venture. If you worked for another startup before in a different capacity, talk about that, because it means you understand the mechanics of what's there. If you're brand new and you worked in corporate America, then talk about what you've accomplished there, because it will make a big difference in how they see you. The team extends beyond, however, your founding team. So if you're outsourcing development, those kind of things, that comes into play as well. So they're going to want to know, where's that team? What's the caliber of them? How does that work? And then there's two other key components to the team. So when you take venture capital, ideally you would walk in with a five-member board. Two of those members can be founders, maybe three, depending on how it's there. You won't end up with more than two after you take money, though. Um, you need at least one independent. And by independent, I don't mean you picked your best buddy, you know, just because you like him and you know he'll vote with you. That's not what I'm talking about. You need one independent who is an ex ideally an expert in the field that you're targeting, right? Who understands the market that you're going after, who's lived through startups and things before, but is going to act as an independent third party, just like a paid board member does in a public company. 
Um, the VCs will generally take two seats. Almost always you will have two VCs going together. It almost never happens that they invest as a single, and each one of them will take a board seat as a part of that process. So what kind of funding, right? So there's different kinds of things, and as the slide kind of illustrates, the math around how venture capital is structured has changed a little bit. A few years ago, you would think that, you know, what is considered a seed round, right, today is actually angel money or pre, you know, pre-rev money. So we've moved the bar a little bit, um, and I forget the lady's name who spoke, like probably pretty you all, but she talked about that as well. So it's really important to understand what's going to be required at each stage. So you can kind of see, we talked about like what they're looking for. It's interesting. So the 8 to 10% in warrants, I've seen that number in the last 12 months go as high as 25, which is kind of insane. So unless you're starving, I would advise you to walk away from deals that are like that because it's really hard to get to the next stage once you've done that. One of the things that's very important, as you've always talking about VCs earning money, VCs actually have to convert their fund three times over. So if a VC raise, they raise a $500 million fund. At the end of the fund, they need to have $1.5 billion out of that fund. And they need to demonstrate 20% per year return on that money. Otherwise, it's going to be really challenging for them to go raise their next fund. So are you ready, right? Um, how many people can say that they actually meet the proof points on here, right? Yeah. It, it's hard, right? And the, and the game has changed a little bit in that just having a product generally isn't good enough. If your product is phenomenal, right, then maybe it is. But that's probably only good enough for that pre-seed money. So to put it in perspective, it's probably only good enough for a quarter million maybe even half a million, depending on the team and the size of the market and how far along you are. But if you're thinking you're going to raise two or three million dollars, so you can actually afford to pay yourself and you don't eat top ramen, right, every day, then you're going to have to have a little bit more traction. And if you're in one of those markets where you're not going to have revenue, you need to demonstrate the path to revenue. So I would ask if you really want to raise venture capital, and the reason I say that is because once you raise the money, you actually have a new boss, right? So maybe they don't own 50% of your company yet, but they will. Um, <laughs> and so when we talk about being removed from the board, there's all these other things. And so just be sure that you're willing to take that risk and that you can't figure out a way to get to revenue first. Because my personal belief is if you don't have to take money, don't take money and only take money to scale. So the, the team, again, the proof points, these kind of things, these are the things that you need to have. The interesting thing when it comes down to the bottom part, how's your story documented? So I would say that it's really important that you do have those pieces, a really well-written executive summary, because VCs won't generally take the time to look at your pitch deck. They won't. Um, so if you can write something in a paragraph that someone can read and understand, that's compelling enough to catch their eye, then hopefully you get the chance to actually bring your pitch deck in and get, you know, a 30-minute meeting to actually pitch. And if you can do that, that's really key. The one-pager, how many guys have a one-pager in the room? How many teams, right? That's really important, too, because it says exactly what you're looking for, right? What do you need? What does your team look like? Those kind of things. So you make it really straightforward for VCs who get hit, as we talked about earlier, with thousands and thousands of requests on an annual basis. So this, I think, is maybe the most important thing of all. Um, picking the right VC. And no one on the team other than the CEO can ultimately do this. Being the CEO is really lonely, and I know that people who are sitting here with their co-founders go, but my buddy, we're like good and we're happy together, right? I'm sure you are. But in the end, there can only be one chief at the end of the day. And they have to actually go through this process. You can work through it as a team, but in the end, you want to have things in your operating agreement, right, that there's a lever there. Someone has to control at the end. Structuring that operating agreement where, you know, when you come to an impasse, somebody can make the decision is really, really key. And I think that when you're looking for the VC, look at their portfolio, right? Do they have com companies in the portfolio 
not necessarily that are in your market, but is the customer set the same, right? So would there be synergy in funding your company and help you get to revenue? Because the goal is always to get to revenue. If they have that, great. Then go and look and see who else they invest, in side, invest with side by side, right? Who's the other venture firm? Very easy to find out. It's all public information, right? Does that VC meet the same criteria? Do they match the philosophies of how you want to build and grow your business when you look at the firms that they've invested in? How does that look over time, right? How have those firms grown as a part of that? And then, you know, from the other side, who's going to be the partner that's going to sit on your board? Because you really have to get along with that person. And if you, if you don't, um, <laughs> it's going to be a pretty miserable experience for you. Um, and, and at the end of the day, this is your new business partner. So it can either be an awesome relationship or a really, really bad one. So your valuation. So these are some things that you can do to improve valuation. And it's really either traction or demonstrated adoption. One of those kind of has to be there to improve the valuation. The other thing can be how you outfit your board. So I'll disagree a little bit with what you've all had to say earlier. I do think in some cases, outfitting your board can be really helpful. So I've taken two companies public. Um, the last company that we started, which we sold, we actually on day one gave up 10% equity. Now that might sound a little bit crazy, but we picked five board members. We gave each of them 2%. But we sat down as a group, the co-founders did, and said, our company has no value today, right? We haven't built anything yet, but we know who our customer is. We picked the people who could make those introductions to us from a customer perspective, who could help us get to revenue, and we gave them 2%. Our viewpoint was 10% of you know, nothing is still nothing. We sold that company 14 and a half months later. We had 28 of the IR500 and Fortune 500 as clients, based upon the introductions that those people made. Each of those guys got a few million dollars right, for their effort, but it was well worthwhile. And I can tell you, doing it again, I'd do exactly the same thing. So pretty quick here, right? We talked a little bit about what the VCs are looking for. Whatever you're going to ask for, ask for 30 to 50% more. If you're a hardware company, absolutely ask for 50% more. If you're a software company, maybe you can get away with 30%, but you definitely want to have that cushion because something will absolutely go wrong. Pre and post money, I could talk about this, but Brad Feld has a great post. So go to Feld Thoughts. He goes into minute detail as to how pre and post money valuations work. Uh, I won't go into the pitching piece, although it's really critical. If you will tweet me or send me an email, um, and I'll give you the information at the end, I will actually send you the link to a deck that I gave at another conference that talks about the perfect pitch and exactly what you need to have in that. So being prepared, right? Make sure you're prepared. And by that, it's like all the pieces that you see up there, plus rehearsing. Just be able to answer the questions on the fly, because VCs are not necessarily kind. Closing thoughts. The last thing I'll say about this, that you can read all the other pieces, but the one piece that's up here that really matters is A players attract A players, right? B players attract C players. Hire the A player. If that means you have to give up a little bit more equity, once you know you can trust that person, do it. Because that will make the difference in whether or not your company is a success or a failure, and it will make a huge difference in how you're able to recruit talent again. Because just like you want to work with super smart people and brilliant people, so does everybody else. So I'll open it up for questions now. In, in term, hi. In terms of financials, what sort of revenue do you expect to see at the different phases, like you see, uh, you know, uh, stage A, et cetera, and what sort of projections would you expect to see as well over a few years? Um, at seed stage, I don't know that you necessarily have to have revenue. That'd be awesome, right? But like the pre-seed, kind of that angel, you know, beyond your mom and dad saying, we like you, and so we're going to write you a check. Um, if you have revenue, that's great. But if you don't, they're really betting on you and on your vision and kind of what you see. Like being able to show a plan, like you've all talked about the difference between an angel and a professional angel, right? So some people are going to do it because they like you and they bet on you. It's just a gut instinct feel, to be honest. Yep. Um, an angel, whether they be a syndicate or an individual with a portfolio, um, it's kind of like playing roulette. So they're going to look for some basic metrics. But the, you got to understand, those people, right, when we do that, like my portfolio has 37 companies in it, right? When 
people do that, they have 30, 40, 50 companies in there, so they're playing the game like a VC plays the game. For a VC, they're going to look at 7% month-over-month growth generally. I was wondering, those board members, were they given preferred shares or common shares or some combination? For who, who, uh -oh. Common shares for who? You mentioned one of, the pub, one of the companies you took public had five board members that were given 2% of the company each. Oh, How no, was so, that structured? Wait, so no, um, actually, we didn't take that company public. We sold the company, which is awesome, because we never raised any capital and we got to keep all the money. Nice. Okay. <laughs> um, but the company we, one of the companies we did take pub public, at the time we took the company public, had seven board members. Right? Four of those seats were occupied by venture capitalists because we took money, right? Okay. And three of those seats were occupied, one by our CFO and the other two by two of the founders. And the structure of those uh, compensation packages was mostly preferred then? Yes. Okay. Yes. And what is the ideal size of the cap table? 50? Too big? Too many people, but... Yeah, that's too many. Um, 20? 20. Oh, okay. That's bigger than I thought. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, thank hey, you. You've been sure. great, by the way. Thank okay, you. I'm going to ask a little bit of a novice question. I started my company up, but it was um, I'm kind of starting over, just so to speak. Um, there's a lot of information that I don't know. Now, if I'm going to be building my company and I want the absolute best on my team, which I know that I need in the IP people, um, before I even get to in the investors, because they want to know how much money do you need, how do I figure out exactly how much money I'm going to need based on staffing? Do I go online and figure out who these people are? Like, how do you find Go find the people you want to work for you. Okay. So, right? Okay. So you can certainly use tools, things like salary.com, those kind of things, it, it, you know, um, to go look at things, Glassdoor, right, to see sort of what people make. Mm -hmm. um, but find the people you want to work for you, and if you can sell your vision. This is really key, right? Because okay. the VCs are going to say, can you sell your vision to other A players? And if you say, hey, I need this money, and I've got these people committed to come on board with me, and they're rock stars, okay. you'll get funded. Okay, so basically, <laughs> I need to do I find people who are already working for other companies, look for people to snag, or I'm looking yeah. for people who are just I mean, good like, at what they do? If you know that you need a superstar marketing person, start asking around. You know, talk to your friends, like, who do you know that's awesome at this? I know I need this type of marketing, right? Okay. You know, can you introduce me to some people? Start and have conversations with them, like, say, hey, I'm looking to build this. Is it exciting to you? Would you come on board and work with me? Let me, you know, tr see if you can sell your vision to them. Okay. And then ask, like, what would it take to get you to do that? And how what do would I, you want? And how do I know which people, who do I need? I need an IP person, I need a lawyer, I need a, like, what? Well, your lawyer, I'm not giving equity to. Like, like how does that? <laughs> but um, you need a lawyer, you're going to need a finance person because to raise venture capital, you need an audited, a set of audited financials. Okay. So you're going to need a CPA of okay. some type, right? Yeah. Those are relatively cheap. A lot of times you can get um, deferred on your legal fees, right? Okay. Like okay. DLA Piper is really great. I'm not plugging any lawyers. Um, but th they do that on a pretty regular basis. They work with a lot of startups, so they do that. So they'll do your legal, and they take the deferred fees for later. Okay. Right? So, so there's some things like that. I would, um, are, where, do you, where are you from? Advertising and marketing. Oh, well, I'm, I'm from Michigan. I live in L.A. You live in L.A.? Yes, yes. Um, so there's got to be, like, and I don't know, uh, I think there's a plug and play there. There's got to be some people that, where there's some co-working space that's going to have some office hours and stuff like that. Start checking that out and going and looking for the people that are coming and giving advice. Okay. And start building out the table, right? You're, you're doing good at taking notes, right? Yes. So start building it out and figuring okay. out what that financial model looks like. Okay. And then go from there. And yeah. so how do I know when I'm ready to actually start looking for the, uh, the investment after I get all of, well, I know I'm going to get in contact with you to get the information. So <laughs> we'll talk about that later. All right. Thank you. Cool. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. I love your energy. I appreciate that. You mentioned how you did your B2B sales by giving Equity Away to give uh, to get the intros, can you give us other tips about how startups can address big corporate companies? Um, yeah, so I'll tell you something that we've done multiple times, right? And I think it works phenomenally. If you can find a big corporation, say for instance, that is, has a hole in their portfolio, but you can fill that hole, right? There's two benefits to that. Um, if you can get them to say, like, hey, let's just partner, right? Can I have access to your sales team and create a, part, a strategic partnership? Right? So if you can get their sales guys helping, it extends your sales force dramatically, and you also end up with a potential acquirer. So there's, there's two bonuses out of that. I'll give you an example. We had a wireless security company um, that ultimately we ended up selling to HP, but we partnered with Computer Associates. So CA didn't have this. They needed something in that space. So I went and got meetings with them. They had a team of people who were pushing wireless security. They let us give them our product. They literally went and recommended our product and charged us nothing. 
So we created this whole lead funnel with them to do that. We ultimately sold to someone else because they don't buy hardware and we had a hardware component to what we do. But it works really effectively. So if you can find some strategic partners like that, um, they also could be potentially funders, right? So a lot of them have strategic capital. So who at the company am I looking for? Am I looking for somebody who's in charge of partners or the CFO or the CEO? I would go or... to somebody who's in charge of partners. So go to the CMO, go to someone who's running their channel program if they have a channel program, right? Um, ask for a warm introduction if you can, right? Like work your LinkedIn or your friend's network, right? To see if you can get somebody to make the introduction for you because you're much more likely to be able to get to that person to have a meaningful conversation. Hi, Joy. Thank you. My name is Ivan. Uh, my question is, uh, if a company from Latin America or another country comes to make a, um, a petition for evaluation, uh, what kind of things do you evaluate extra if, the, is, if this is a company from another country? Uh, do you have another points to evaluate? Oh, uh, so, so a Latin American company, let me make sure I'm clear, right? You want to pitch in the U.S. Yeah. Is there advice for that? Yeah. I, yes. I, I, even if it's, it's a Delaware company. Yeah, so um, I would look for funds, like um, Paul Alstrom was on this stage earlier, right? So Paul's great because he, that's his sweet spot, right? He loves it. Um, find a VC who's invested in your country before. Ideally, if you want big money, probably find a U.S.-based VC because the challenge in like, some of the emerging markets, like Mexico, for instance, right now, is the funds have kind of depleted, yep. right? And they haven't had an exit. So that's a problem, right? Because they have no more capital to invest. So when uh, you've always talking about the cycle, right? Ideally find someone who's like midway through their cycle or later, right? Or is raising another fund. Usually VCs, like Alt is a good example, when they get about three-fourths of the way through the fund, they'll go raise the next fund, so there's always capital there. But find someone who's invested in your market because you want somebody who, who knows your market, even if you're going to be global, right? And work with them. All right. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, Jared. Great conversation, thank you. So quick question, in your experience, are certain verticals more attractive to VCs than others? Now, I do understand that they have their own interests, but there are, for example, education technology. What is your experience with yeah, that? Yeah, there, there's VCs that invest in education, right? So finding the right VC, there's VCs that invest in restaurants, God help them, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, there are people like that. So just finding someone that looks after that, and, and literally, Google is your friend, right? Like look up, look up educational software, venture capital investment. Literally, just Google that. Like, I don't know exactly who those people are, but because um, I've never dealt in that space, but they definitely exist. And go after those guys. I mean, target the people who are going to understand what you're what you're pitching. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Uh, I run a bootstraps and profitable um, vertical CRM system, and okay. I've had one of my um, uh, biggest customers offer an investment, seven figures for about ten percent. But I'm concerned that. Um, it's going to eliminate some of uh, my other markets from competitive, uh, you know, th they're mm -hmm. not wanting to deal with me because their competitor is a key investor. What are your thoughts on that topic? So let me make sure I'm, I'm right. So they've offered you a seven-figure investment for how much? 10%. For 10%. What are the limitations on the term sheet? They're very limited. It's, it's an excellent term sheet, but the problem is I'm, I'm thinking that it might slow my growth because other competitors might not want to deal with me given I'm partly owned by... Can you white label it major for them? Competitor. So if they want, they want to use the technology as well, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So why can't you create an OEM agreement for them, allow them to white label it, and then you push that off, let them do whatever they want. They'll have rights to all the upgrades as you build out the platform, and then you continue to market under your own brand to everyone else. Okay, and you don't think others would see any... That, that's pretty commonplace. I mean, like, you know, there's a lot of, like, three-sided models. That's what I would strive for. But, I mean, that's a big investment for 10% too. So if, you, if they wouldn't agree to that, then I'd probably do some trial stuff in other markets that you want to target, you know, just kind of send some feelers out and find out mm -hmm. if it would have a big impact. Okay. Because I wouldn't want to see you, like, hamstring yourself. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. in theory, yeah. if you can do the OEM or a white label, that's what I would do. Okay. So rebrand it under their label and let them run with it. Right? And then that way you keep your brand and you keep, you know, okay. moving along. All right. Thank you. Sure.